over the years, I've encouraged us to listen to how scripture speaks to our faith, contributes to it. I love using the godly play idea of wondering, such as I wonder where you are in this story. Enter and move around in the story for yourself. We ask ourselves what these actions and words from God's people thousands of years ago show us of their faith lives. We listen for how these scriptures apply to us and how they're relevant for us now, so many generations later. Well, I read a piece by an author and PhD student at Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand, named Michael Toy, wherein he wondered about the difference between relevance of scripture to one's life and resonance of it for all of us. And I think he's on to something. Here's what I mean. I enjoy listening to music in my home, my car. I usually put on something that suits my mood. Thinking back over my week, it was Edith Piaf, Jeff Buckley, King FM, and Janis Joplin. The music is relevant to how I'm feeling or what I'm doing, even where I'm going. It's part of my ebb and flow. And then when it no longer fits, it's Alexa, turn off. Is it relevant or not is my question at that point. Now, those of you who sing and dance to it, who make the music, are further along the continuum from encountering it as related by content to more participatory engagement with it and moving all along the way to resonance with it. When I began learning to play the mandolin, I chose it because it sounded so alive. I was in middle school maybe, and it sounded alive in a way I didn't feel with my sister's cello, guitar. Now the mandolin, like a violin, has strings tuned to four specific notes, G, D, A, and E. If you're familiar at all with a mandolin, you know it has not four strings for those four notes, but eight. Eight tuned in pairs, so each pair plays the same note. Instead of plucking one string to make the note sound, your pick strikes two of them simultaneously. The double strings create a stronger vibrational energy, produce a fuller sounding tone, sustain a longer resonance of higher strength than plucking a single string can. In short, they vibrate together, making each note sound like it's ringing. Don't worry, we're heading back to scripture soon. Holding a mandolin against your body, feeling it while making this ringing happen, adds an additional kind of resonance. And I could feel it whether I was playing Beethoven or bluegrass. That resonance ringing of paired strings also vibrated within me, made me part of it. So this is where I'll let you all imagine that I'm very good at playing, although I'm not. I do love to. This powerful experience of resonance is part physics, part instrument, partly the player, the hearer, and even the moment. It is, however, wholly real. Even if we can't see those strings vibrate or feel the bowl of the instrument reverberate, and even if we don't know why it sounds as it does, it still can make us weep or sing along. And I think faith is like this. Real, tangible, alive. Even if we cannot explain every bit of it and what makes the spirit of God ring within us. More than 
the marvelous goodness of being relevant, faith is especially alive in this remarkable resonance. We hear Paul today, and as beautifully as Tola read it, if, it's, if you're hearing it for the first time, it sounded a little crazy. It sounded a little circular, didn't it? We hear Paul trying to nail it down and make sense of Christ's resurrection to the Corinthians. And it's tough. Even he sounds like he goes in circles. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our proclamation has been in vain. And your faith has been in vain. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. Let's see what I mean. At first, this might sound a bit incomprehensible, not just for the circularity, but also because he is arguing for something our world thinks of as impossible, and he knows it's real, true. He finishes the thought saying, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Now, Episcopalians are resurrection people. So Paul's arguing may not present quite so great a challenge or demand as much explanation as for some. And really, that's sort of part of the point. If we see resurrection as that which did or did not happen long ago to one man, we're stuck with asking what relevance is it to our lives, to us? If we know it happens in the here and now of our lives, that resurrection is ongoing, and then we're letting it resonate. We are participating. There's a story about the late Bishop Dan Corrigan, long known for his work in civil and human rights, activism and social justice, peace efforts, and he was one of those three bishops who ordained the first women to the priesthood in 1974, two years before we actually voted to approve doing so. He was a guest preacher somewhere that Lent, retired. And after worship, according to a bystander, someone asked, Bishop, do you really believe in, res in the resurrection? Well, the bystander quickly became an eavesdropper because she was sure there was no way this man she saw as an octogenarian liberal lion of the church believed in literal resurrection. Well, Bishop Corrigan replied without pause, yes, I believe in the resurrection. I have seen it too many times not to. This is resonant faith. You see it, you feel it. It's not something long ago. It is, but it's also that. The mystery of our Christian faith is more than applying scripture to our lives and seeing it fit, getting the right interpretation. When Jeremiah, Luke, and Paul first set down the words, they were alive to them. This was life. Through their words, God still speaks to us, to quote Kelly from last week, and we experience the Holy One as alive. Again, from Toy, it is this encounter with the divine that gave life to the faith of the mystics like Hildegard, Julian, and Teresa. The readings then become less about mining for nuggets of applicable wisdom and more about looking and listening for resonance with the beauty we find in our lives, in the world, and in each other. In our gospel from Luke, we heard part of Jesus' sermon called the Beatitudes. Reading only for relevance, we would try to decide if Jesus is giving a description of how things are and will someday be turned upside down in the life to come, or if Jesus is saying, this is how we should be turning things on end in a prescriptive way. 
Is it that those who are poor in this life will receive the abundant opposite in the kingdom of God to come? Or that Jesus' followers should be poor, hungry, weeping, reviled, instead of consoled, filled, laughing, respected? Both of these ways of coming at it ask what the relevance of Jesus' sermon is to us. And those are good questions. What if we go this other way and ask how Jesus' teaching resonates with our own encounters with the Holy Spirit, individually, but also collectively? There is a sense of a difference in praying together in this room with friends and family online than there is alone and apart. So it's a both piece. How do Jesus' teaching resonate with our encounters of the Holy One? Like Bishop Corrigan's answer to the question of belief in resurrection, we need to ask not, do I buy into it? Does it apply to me? Rather, where have I seen this myself? Where has this come to life in this church, in my neighborhood? Where have we been in the midst of these blessings and curses ourselves? With those we love, with those on the street, in line to get boosted. We know one string plucked will sound the correct note, but two resonating together will ring. Where have we been the other mandolin string causing Jesus' teaching to ring? Last week, I talked about how our lives don't come at us one event or crisis or joy at a time. Real life is that many can happen at once, and usually do. Weeping and laughing, poor in something rich in another, full of blessing and also woe. And God is with us in the whole mess of it. Christ calls us to be present to each other in this way, too, in the whole mess of it. Like those simultaneously vibrating strings, able to bring fullness and strength to each tune they come to life in. The reading from Jeremiah that Kelly brought to life beautifully. I'm going to have to think of Jeremiah as a strong woman now. It sounds a little like Jesus' beatitudes in reverse order. First, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. And then, blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. Quite the opposite. To be trusting in God, or it's quite possible to be trusting in God, and then be surprised to find ourselves lulled into trusting mere mortals, even more so. The drive around us that doesn't come from God. Those things that focus us on pursuing more and better just for us and ours, not for all. And then we hear, I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Depending on what is found within us, how we live, this is good news or not. In the ground of our faith, I think all of us will sometimes have been those desert shrubs and other times the thriving leafy trees. When Jesus gives this teaching, he's among a great multitude of people who have come to hear him to be healed. And he healed all of them, we read. And there's this little phrase that I rarely dwell on, but it jumped out this week. It's tucked in right before the Beatitudes. 
and all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. They reached out to touch him. They hoped, they listened, they reached out, they were healed. Power going out for that healing from Jesus with each encounter. And so sometimes I imagine this scene as Jesus being incredibly tired, drained, as he begins to teach them and give this sermon. But it doesn't say that. The power goes out of him, and he lets them reach for it. That is part of what he brings. That reciprocity is alive in the air for them that day, and hopefully for us. Need meeting help, broken people meeting divine love. Like the resonance of each pair of strings is real, healing and sickness, hunger and fulfillment, grief and laughter of Christ and his church. These bring out the mystery of faith and are alive with the grace of experiencing his love. Amen.